Good morning. Good morning. I wish you a happy Good Friday. Can I have the slides on the screen, please? And so uh, I want to greet all of us. TGIF, this is one of the rare days that we can say from the pulpit. TGIF, thank God it's Friday. You all know this acronym, right? TGIF, yeah. Uh, it refers, uh, many of us look forward to the end of the working week, yeah. Uh, but really, apart from TGIF, Friday is really a happy day. Friday is a happy day, yeah? Uh, some people say Friday, yeah? Do you all know why Friday is a happy day? Let me tell you, okay? Friday is a happy day because the next day is a sadder day. Yeah, Saturday, sadder day, yeah? Okay. But you know, unlike other ordinary happy Fridays, today is a specially happy Friday. It is Good Friday. And this morning, we want to look at the goodness in Good Friday. Where really, why really do we say that Good Friday is good? Of course, all of you already know, uh, Good Friday is the day where we remember Jesus dying on the cross. This was about 2,000 years ago. Jesus of Nazareth, he lived he died in the first century AD. There's plenty of evidence for this, right? Even uh, non-Christian historians will agree Jesus was a real flesh and blood man who really lived, who really died on a Roman cross, crucified as a form of capital punishment. All this took place about 2,000 years ago. And of course, we know too that the cross is central to the Christian faith. The cross is a central symbol of Christianity, the cross is also a central part of what God is doing in the world. But I want to say this this morning, the cross does not stand alone. If we want to understand the true goodness of Good Friday, if we want to understand the true scope, the true significance, the true power of the crucifixion, then we have to zoom out a little bit. We have to take a look at the big picture. We have to see what came before Good Friday, what happened on the cross on Good Friday, and also what follows after Good Friday. And so let's start with what came before. Before Good Friday, there was a Good Friday. Yeah, a small g, Good Friday. Earlier, before, the big g, Good Friday. What do I mean by this? You know that small g, Good Friday, it took place way back at the very creation of humanity. The first book of the Bible, Genesis, tells us this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good. It was evening, and it was morning, the first day. We see here that our Creator, God, formed, created this entire universe. Let there be light, God said, and there was light. And God said, it is good. That was just the first day, and over the next few days, God continued to create the sun, the moon, the stars, uh, the land, the sea, the sky, plants and trees, seed and fruit, all sorts of animals, beasts of the ground, fish in the sea, birds in the air. God created and God called all of these things good. And then God kept it off on the sixth day. Genesis, once again, chapter 1, verse 26, God said, let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness. So God created humankind in His image. In the image of God, He created them. Male and female, He created them. God saw everything that He had made, and indeed, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. In all the previous days, God created and He said that it was good. But here, on the sixth day, it was not just good. God said it was very good. This creation of humanity, both male and female, God declares to be very good. And so the Bible tells us this is the sixth day. Do, do you know what day of the week is the sixth day? It was a Friday. Yeah, day seven, the final day of creation where God rested, that is the Sabbath day. Sabbath is Saturday. Yeah, so even to this day, the Jews celebrate Sabbath on Saturday. Uh, in, in some European languages, in Italian, in Spanish, Saturday is Sabbath, even till today. Yeah, so seven days, Saturday, and day six, the day before, is Friday. On day six, on that Friday, 
God looked upon all His creation. God looked upon humanity, the crown of His creation, made in His very own likeness and image. And God declared on that Friday, it is very good. This is a small g, Good Friday, way before that big g, Good Friday. And all through the years, through the centuries, through the millennia, continuing in the cycle of the weeks to remember God created on that small g, Good Friday. You know, there's something important uh, here that we tend to miss out. I want to highlight this for us this morning. Is this, God considers that His creation is good, that His creation is worth saving. You know, in some other religions, in some other philosophies, the idea is that, oh, this universe is uh, broken, there's, there's suffering, there's evil, and uh, so it's destroyed and then it gets restarted over again. But that is not what our Creator God does. God does not abandon His creation. God not only creates, He also sticks with His creation. Even when creation falls, even when creation gets broken, our Creator acts to intervene, to deliver, to save. We hear this in the Gospel according to John, this famous verse, John 3.16. For this is the way God loved the world. He gave His one and only Son so that everyone who believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world should be saved through Him. And so we see God loves this world. God loves His creation. God doesn't hate us. God says this creation is good. It is worth saving. God loves His creation so much, it is worth Him dying for. And that's exactly what God did when He took that cross on the big G, Good Friday. And so Good Friday has its roots way earlier than just the cross. Good Friday is rooted on that first Friday of creation when God already said this creation, this humanity, it is good. Good Friday is rooted in the goodness of God. Good Friday is rooted in the faithful, persistent love of our Creator. And on that Good Friday, God Himself takes the cross because He considers His fallen creation worth saving. This is a display of God's goodness. Second, on Good Friday, on Good Friday, we are offered the gift of good standing, good standing with God. We have heard that our Creator, He is faithful, He is loving, He is persistent, He doesn't let us go. When we, His creation, we are unfaithful to Him, when we fail to persist with Him, when we reject His goodness, He remains good. He remains faithful. But we do that, don't we? We turn away from God. We reject His goodness toward us. We break God's heart. And all of this is what the Bible calls sin. And because of our sin, because of our turning away from God, we no longer have good standing before a good and righteous God. But our good and faithful and persistent Creator dealt with sin. On Good Friday, God Himself took the cross to save His good creation from our broken state. Elsewhere in the Bible, 2 Corinthians says this, that God made the one, Jesus, who had, who did not know sin, to be sin for us, so that in Him we would become the righteousness of God. At the cross, Jesus took humanity's place. Jesus took humanity's penalty. Romans chapter 6, for the payoff of sin is death. This is the payoff, the penalty that we're talking about here, the penalty of sin, the consequence of turning away from God. The payoff of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is God's gift to us. God offers us this gift on Good Friday. But do we receive this gift? Do we unwrap this gift and enjoy and savour this gift? Or do we kind of just leave this gift somewhere, you know, in, in our storeroom, never really opening it, never really enjoying, delighting in this gift from God? Well, sometimes we do that because we think that we don't really need God's gift. 
maybe we think we're actually quite all right. We are not that bad, doing kind of okay. And anyway, the creator said, humanity is very good, right? So, yeah, you know, I don't think I really need that gift from God. Thanks anyway, though. Yes, humanity is made very good. Genesis tells us this. But humanity is also fallen. We have been unfaithful to a faithful God. God turns to us, but we turn away from Him. God holds us so dearly in His heart. But time and again, we end up breaking God's heart. We are, in fact, in need of God's gift of good standing. We need that gift to be restored to good standing before God. Now, this following passage from C.S. Lewis applies, I think, to all of us. Uh, shall I invite us to read this all together? Ready? Almost certainly, there are unsatisfied claims, human claims, against each one of us. For who can really believe that in all his dealings with employers and employees, with husband or wife, with parents and children, in quarrels and in collaborations, he has always attained honesty and fairness? Carry on. Few of us have always, in full measure, given our pupils or patients or clients or whatever our particular consumers may be called, what we were being paid for. We have not always done quite our fair share or some tiresome work if we found a colleague or partner who could be beguiled into carrying the heavy end. Quite true, isn't it, this passage? You know, we do have unsatisfied debts that we owe to others and that we owe to God also. We have debts that we owe to other human beings that we are not conscious of, maybe we don't want to be conscious of. What more? The debts we owe to God. How can we repay these debts? Well, we can't, at least not by ourselves. You know, sometimes we think that we can restore ourselves to good standing with God. We can save ourselves on our own terms. We try harder, we uh, work harder, we make more sacrifices, we have more self-discipline. But is that really God's intention? Are we trying to get into good standing with God on our own terms, based on our own expectations? Sometimes we think we can save ourselves on our own terms. And sometimes we even go so far as to, to force this, to impose this upon God. We try to bend God to our own demands and expectations. And we see this in the scene at the cross read for us just now. We see here over and over the leaders, the Pharisees, the soldier, even that other crucified criminal on the cross. Uh, by the way, the Greek word here for criminal simply reads evil doer. You know, all of these people in this scene, they repeatedly challenge Jesus. Jesus, if you are the Messiah, if you are the chosen one, if you are the king, then save yourself. They wanted Jesus to prove himself, but on their own terms. If you are the king, Jesus, save yourself. You know, there's a lot of subtleties, there's a lot of subtext underneath that one simple statement. Imagine with me the Pharisees thinking, Jesus, if you are really the king, you can save yourself from this humiliating torture by these foreign oppressors, can't you? If you are really the king, you can overthrow them and make us an independent nation once more. If you are really the king, you will know that nothing is more important than our country, than our nation. Sounds familiar, right? We hear this sort of language even in our day. Or imagine the soldiers. Jesus, if you are really the king, you wouldn't allow yourself to be tortured and mocked in such a way. You're such a weakling, Jesus. Where is your soldiers? Where are your armies? Don't you know that might makes right in this world? If you are the king, you will know that nothing is more important than power. Again, in our 21st century, we hear these sorts of voices, don't we? Or imagine that evil doer on the cross. Jesus, if you are really the king, get me off this Roman cross so I can live to fight another day. I didn't do anything wrong. I just gave the enemy what they deserve. Don't you know, Jesus, that violence and sabotage are really just to advance our cause? Sacrifices have to be made. The ends justify the means. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there. If you are the king, you'll know that what is most important is that our side wins. 
Once again, we hear such things in our world, online, on the internet. Are we, even in our time, like these characters that we saw on Good Friday, demanding that Jesus, you prove yourself, but on my terms, insisting that God will save us based on my expectations, my yardsticks, Instead of bending our knees before the king, do we demand that the king bend to our standards, to our expectations? Sometimes we think that we don't need God's gift. We have unsatisfied debts that we owe to others and to God. And at times we even try to bend God to our own expectations instead of bending our knees before the king. And so Jesus On that cross, he cried, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Quite right, isn't it? So often, we do not know what we do. How then can we obtain this good standing before the king? Well, we have to receive, we have to accept the gift that he offers us on his terms, not ours. And we can learn this from that other crucified criminal, that other evildoer on the cross. The first thing he did was to confess his sin. He acknowledged his wrongdoing. We have been justly condemned. We deserve this punishment. We were wrong. As he confessed his wrongdoing, he acknowledged that in the first place, he was not in good standing before God. He acknowledged he was in need of God's gift. And like this evildoer, we are created good. We are worth saving. But by ourselves, because of our brokenness, because of our sin, we remain indebted. We remain in poor standing with God. We are all in need of God's gift. And so like this evildoer, the first thing that we need to do is to confess our sin before God. Second, the evildoer acknowledged Jesus as king. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He didn't say, if you come into your kingdom. He said, when you come into your kingdom. In this statement, he implicitly already recognized that Jesus is the king. You know, of all the people that we uh, saw in this scene, right? Uh, Pilate, the leaders of the people, uh, the soldiers, the crowds. Out of so many people, it was only this one man who acknowledged Jesus' kingdom, Jesus' kingship, that Jesus is the king. Out of all the people in this scene, it was this one man who didn't try to bend Jesus to his own expectations. Instead, he bent his heart. He bent his heart in submission to God. He acknowledged Jesus is the king, that he had no good standing with the king. He had confessed that he was guilty. He deserved his just punishment. And in his helplessness, all he could ask, Jesus, remember me. And likewise for us, the second thing we need to do is to acknowledge, call upon Jesus as our King. On this Good Friday, we are offered the gift of God, the gift of good standing with God. Are we in need of this gift? Do we need to receive this gift to unwrap and to savour this gift? And maybe some of you are visitors here in this hall, but maybe some of you have been here in church for ages. Maybe some of you are actively serving and contributing already, yet deep inside, you're not sure. You're not sure whether you have this good standing with God. This Good Friday, King Jesus offers us the gift of good standing with Him. Let's receive this gift, firstly, by confessing our sin before God. Secondly, by acknowledging the King, by giving our hearts, giving our our allegiance, our loyalty, our love unto the King. And later on, we will have a time of prayer, a time of confession, a time of meditation. We'll have some space to do that, to receive God's gift. And we can be assured that when we confess our sins before God, when we acknowledge Him as our Lord and King, Jesus gives us the assurance of good standing with Him. Jesus will respond to us just as He did to that man on the cross. You will be with me in paradise. This is Jesus', King Jesus' assurance to us. Now, paradise, paradise, that is a good place. And so we have, thirdly, after Good Friday, 
the promise of a good place with a good person. These days, the word paradise, we uh, take it as kind of synonymous with heaven, yeah, a place of uh, blissful rest after death. Some of you may have uh, watched this before, this comedy series, The Good Place. Uh, in, in this show, the main character, played by Kristen Bell, uh, she's died and she finds herself in the afterlife. She's not actually that good a person, and so she herself is a bit surprised that she's in this uh, place like heaven, this good place. Yeah, so that's the premise of this show. It's a pretty uh, decent show. I, uh, I think it's worth watching. Uh, but for our purposes today, this word paradise, this good place, uh, this word paradise is actually an old Persian term, an old uh, Iranian word. Originally, it simply means a garden. Uh, it's not necessarily an otherworldly, not a supernatural uh, garden, but a good place nonetheless, yeah? Uh, and of course, over the centuries, this Persian word uh, got migrated, got taken up by other languages. It did come to refer to a more heavenly, more supernatural sort of place. Uh, but really, the idea is that of a very pleasant place, a very delightful, good place. That's so why I invite us to imagine with me, imagine in your mind's eye, yeah, a, a beautiful garden. Imagine the cool breeze blowing, the lovely green foliage of the trees, bright and beautiful flowers, fragrant, juicy fruit. A good garden, a good place. And doesn't it also remind us of the creation narrative once again? Genesis, our creator God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Right at the very start, a paradise, a good place, a garden. And right at the very end also, in the final book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 21, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them as their God. They will be His peoples, and God Himself will be with them. And then Revelation chapter 22, the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. On either side of the river is a tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, producing fruit each month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It was good. God planted a paradise, a garden, a good place, a good place where humanity dwelt. And at the end of time also, God brings about a new heaven and a new earth, a city, a new Jerusalem, a good place. There, God's renewed humanity will dwell. And in that city, as we heard, guess what? We see a garden, a river flowing right down through the main street of the city. All around it, a tree of life bearing fruit. Now, if you paid attention to uh, how Revelation describes it, right? One tree growing on either side of the river. I, I don't know how that's going to happen. One tree on both sides of the river. Uh, but you know, Revelation is full of rather unusual, strange imagery. So it's uh, not too surprising coming from Revelation. But the point really is this, that in this new city, there is a garden. A garden city, a city in a garden, yeah? Uh, this is one of Singapore's taglines, right? Some of us learned about this in social studies class. Uh, but I want to say that whatever the Bible describes here is way better than uh, what N Parks or what URA can do, yeah? yeah uh, apologies to any of you if you work at N Parks or URA, okay? But the Bible does it better, says it better. And this comes about because our God is good and faithful and persistent. Our Creator does not abandon His creation. He brings about a good place in the beginning, a good place at the very end. And most fundamentally, this place is good because of the presence of a good person. Jesus says, you will be with me in paradise. Uh, it's not just about in paradise. More importantly, it's about with me, with me, 
with Jesus, with the King. You know, just now I asked us to imagine in our minds the, the beautiful garden, right? Uh, the leaves, the flowers, the fruit. When you did that exercise in, in your mind, imagining that garden, was it just you alone in that garden? Were there any other people with you in that scene in your mind's eye? Was God there in that scene in your mind? Today, you will be with me in paradise, says Jesus. You know, a garden without the king's presence is just an empty park. A city without the king's presence is just a sterile metropolis. The place is good because of the presence of a good person. Are we simply looking to end up in a good place? Are we looking to enjoy the presence of a good person? It's not just about where we are going. More importantly, it's about whom we are with. On that Good Friday, Jesus says from the cross, you will be with me. And Revelation affirms it. We heard just now, the home of God is among mortals. God himself will be with them. God promises a good place. And more than that, God promises His own presence, the presence of a good person, our King. You know, I know oftentimes we don't naturally long for or desire God's presence. It's the same with me as well, yeah? Uh, it's easy for us to focus more on an object or an idea, to focus on a place rather than on the person. And so I want to invite all of us, you know, to bring this simple prayer to God in our hearts this Good Friday. This prayer, King Jesus, turn my heart toward you. Work in me that I may long for you, that I may desire your presence, that I may delight in your person. In your name I pray. Amen. May this be the prayer of our hearts because without God's good presence, the place doesn't really matter. The good place is good because a good person is with us. And so this Good Friday, may we, sim may we desire not simply a good place, but may our hearts long to be in the presence of the good person, Jesus, our King. Before Good Friday, there was a Good Friday. On Good Friday, God offers a gift of good standing with Him. After Good Friday, the promise of a good place with a good person. And I'm going to end here without any real conclusion. Uh, this is not good, by the way, this is not good by any uh, standard of preaching or public speaking. I'm going to end on this rather uncertain, awkward, uh, unresolved, discordant note. Because that is exactly how the disciples felt that original Good Friday. And I do this also because today is not the end. The story isn't over. The conclusion comes on the third day. So come back again on Easter Sunday. But for now, like Jesus, it is left hanging.